Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Animaction. Welcome to another entry in the Doctor's Deep Dives, where I take an in-depth look at one specific title from the action cartoons of, well, originally the 80s, but now the 80s and 90s, since I've come to realize I love both decades equally. Having been inspired by the third entry in my Hanna-Barbera retrospective, which if you haven't watched, then you definitely should, today we'll be looking at an entry from late in the studio's long and storied history, and one of my personal favorites, SWAT Cats. Or to give it the full 90s ified title, SWAT Cats, The Radical Squadron. I'll be doing a couple of these shorter videos just to get things rolling again, as there was another slight delay between my last video and this one, and then I'll tackle the next entry in my animated 80s Japan edition, before moving on to the animated 70s. For now though, let's take a look and see what there is to see about Tebow and Razor. Before we look into the details of the show, let's take a second and look at what SWAT Cats is all about. While at its core, what we actually have here is a superhero series about a pair of police officers wronged by the powers that be who adopt costume identities they use to fight crime. It just so happens to take place on a world inhabited by anthropomorphic cats. The show's set in Mega Cat City, a massive urban sprawl protected by the Enforcers, a paramilitary police force under the leadership of Commander Farrell. I want to take a little step aside right here and mention that this seems really similar to the story in Judge Dredd. Here we have Mega Cat City instead of Mega City 1, and the law enforcement called the Enforcers instead of the Judges. Law enforcement here is again paramilitary, and again wear identity hiding helmets. There's just something about it that really reminds me of the 2000 AD series. Anyway, one day while on a mission to stop the city's most notorious criminal mastermind, the evil Dark Cat, an Enforcer fighter crew consisting of weapon specialist Jake Clausen and pilot Chance Furlong had the villain targeted and were ready to take their shot when Commander Farrell, desperate to get the glory of stopping such an infamous baddie, ordered them to back off. Jake and Chance refused, so Farrell overtook the pair, colliding with them in the process. Their damaged plane ended up crashing into Enforcer headquarters and the incident allowed Dark Cat to escape. Farrell used his position as commander to shift all the blame to Jake and Chance, removing them from enforcer duty and assigning them to the city salvage yard. Angered by their treatment and frustrated that the city would be vulnerable under the inept leadership of Farrell, the pair set to work combining Jake's engineering genius and Chance's mechanical prowess to scrounge the scrapyard for the parts they needed to build the absolutely awesome TurboCat, a super versatile VTOL fighter aircraft better than anything in the enforcer arsenal. Chance adopted the alias of T-Bone and Jake the moniker of Razor, a pair of masked crime fighters equipped with an array of gadgets that would make Batman stand up and notice. Aided by their friend and ally Deputy Mayor Kelly Briggs, they set to work protecting Mega Cat City against Dark Cat and a large assortment of other nefarious criminals, all the while evading and embarrassing the incompetent enforcers all along the way. Now as I said in the intro, SWAT Cats was released late in Hanna-Barbera's life cycle in its classic incarnation, airing in 1993, just three short years before the studio was absorbed by Warner. The show was developed from an original pitch by marketing and merchandising duo the Tremblay brothers, Christian and Yvonne. On their website, the duo described themselves as creators of original properties and reinventors of iconic and historic brands, having started in the industry as creators of the 1999 animated series Super Babies. SWAT Cats was released in syndication on September 11, 1993, as part of the fantastic world of Hanna-Barbera programming block, where it aired for just 25 episodes and a clip show over two seasons through January 6, 1995. During its run, the show became the number one animated series of the time, according to the Nielsen ratings, but before it could take advantage of that success, the series was unceremoniously cancelled. There are a few different theories as to why this happened floating around out there with some sources citing former Hanna-Barbera president Fred Sieber as stating it was due to low ratings, but most of them seem to agree that it was primarily due to Ted Turner's aversion to violent cartoons. Violence in children's programming was a huge issue at the time, having abandoned the action-packed diversity of the 80s for the fear-mongering and poor sociological science of the late 1960s. In fact, 1995 saw the formation of the Parents' Television Council, PTC, founded by the conservative Christian activist L. Brant Basel III as the spiritual successor of Peggy Charon's Action for Children's Television Group, ACT. Similar to the way ACT was responsible for Hanna-Barbera shutting down many of their late 60s action shows, the PTC worked to do the same for the mid-90s shows. The CEO of Hanna-Barbera's parent company at the time, the Turner Broadcasting System's Ted Turner, even stated to the United States Congress that his company's cartoons weren't violent and aren't, quote, encouraging kids to kill each other like some of the other cartoon programs do, end quote. 
Having grown up in this era and turned out not to be a deranged sociopath, I don't put much stock in the efforts of groups like this and count myself lucky to have been a cartoon fan during just the right time, when these types of activists were more focused on the devil affecting kids than cartoon violence. So like I mentioned, Hanna-Barbera picked up production of the show and syndicated it upon release through the Fantastic World programming block. Writing duties for the series were assigned to veteran cartoon scribe Glenn Leopold, who'd been scripting tunes since 1977. His credits included everything from the CB Bears and Undercover Elephant, to 80 episodes of the Smurfs, to an impressively large number of Scooby-Doo movies. He also wrote for another of my favorite Hanna-Barbera productions with the Pirates of Darkwater. Directing duties for every episode in the series went to another longtime presence in the animation industry with Robert Alvarez. He'd begun his career as an assistant animator on the 1968 Beatles movie Yellow Submarine, and is still working today with 203 credits in Hanna-Barbera and Cartoon Network Studios animation departments, and 27 directing credits on series like The New Yogi Bear Show, Grave Del High, and several cartoon cartoons. The main voices for the series were provided by Charlie Adler, known for voicing G.I. Joe's Lowlight and Brave Star's Deputy Fuzz as T-Bone, and Barry Gordon, better known as TMNT's Donatello as Razor. The series also included the voice of Daisy Duck, Tress McNeil, as Kaylee, Blue Falcon and famed narrator Gary Owens in the role of Commander Farrell, and some famous voices like Frank Welker and Mark Hamill as other recurring characters throughout the run. Unfortunately, the show met an untimely end with its cancellation in January of 1995, leaving a trio of episodes stuck in production and an additional quartet of episodes in early planning, with several unanswered questions and dangling plotlines. Although it wasn't around long enough for the merchandising train to really get rolling, we did get a very small number of toys. Four figures were released by now-defunct toy company Remco, including Razor and T-Bone, as well as villains Dark Cat and Dr. Viper. As awesome as it would have been, we unfortunately never saw the Turbo Cat make its way into the line. There was also a side-scrolling 2D platforming video game from Hudson Soft released on the Super Nintendo, with the Sega Genesis version being cancelled. The game was actually really well rated and a lot of fun to play, though it wasn't very unique amongst other platformers at the time. The series also managed to get partnerships with White Castle and Carl's Jr. restaurants, resulting in toy lines in each company's versions of a kid's meal. The White Castle versions included monocolored squeezy launcher things, which if you were a kid at the time you know what I mean, and the Carl's Jr. versions were oddly colored versions of various characters and vehicles. Other than that, there were some small things like stickers and a handheld LCD game, it also got six of its episodes released on three different VHS tapes, but we didn't see the full series get a home release until we got a full box set in 2011. That's it though. No comics, no cards, no backpacks, or lunch boxes. However, the series did gain a fairly loyal following of fans like me. The fan base is strong enough that not only did the series get the aforementioned full series DVD release, but unlike so many series from the time, that set's still available today. You can pick it up for yourself at my affiliate link below, which benefits the channel. That's not the end of the SWAT Cats though, as in 2015, the Tremblay brothers announced their intent to release a new series called SWAT Cats Revolution. The brothers launched a Kickstarter campaign to fund this effort, which has since made nearly three times its $50,000 goal. The last update of the campaign came back in June of 2020, and stated that the show's distributor had begun taking the series to producers in an effort to get it on the air. It's been over a year of radio silence though, so the best we can do right now is cross our collective fingers. To tide us over, there are quite a few fan-made products out there available if you just do a quick Google search. So that's it. Another quick entry in my deep dives, looking at a little history and production of one of the 90's coolest action cartoons. I hate seeing how the actions of a handful of misguided people can be so detrimental to creative efforts though, and would have liked to have seen the production team get the chance to bring the series to a satisfying close. Hopefully Revolution materializes at some point and does that for us, although the target audience is apparently 5 to 11 year olds, so even if we do get it, it may very likely not satisfy that itch. Anyway, that's it for this episode. I want to throw out a quick reminder to come join the Discord if you want to talk about anything pop culture or nerdy. Check out both my 80s inspired merchandise and my book, and maybe even pick up your own copy of SWAT Cats. Links for each of those things are down in the video description. Thanks for watching everyone. Stay tuned and stay tuned. As in cartoons. Later.